Happy Friday to you, Cyprus. So good to see you today. Thanks for joining me for Facebook Friday. We've been on this uh, journey together, going through the names of God, and we're going to continue that. We're going to wrap that up actually today. So over the last several weeks, we looked at Jehovah Jireh, which is God is our provider. We've looked at Jehovah Nisi, God is our banner. Last week, we talked about Jehovah uh, Rapha, God is our healer. And today, uh, we've got another name that's maybe one of the uh, least familiar to us. It's not very easy to pronounce, and yet its meaning often brings a smile of relief and comfort to us uh, and to your life whenever you hear it. And that name is Jehovah Mekadesh. Jehovah Mekadesh. The hard part is of pronouncing it, but its meaning is the sweet part. It means the Lord who sanctifies. The Lord who sanctifies. It's a great reminder because it, it reminds us that uh, in, in that name, it's not us that's about our sanctification. It is about Jesus. It is about the Lord work in us. And so that's a great thing. Last week, the several weeks we've been in Exodus, in uh, chapter 19, verses 2 through 6, it shares, uh, it, say, it says this, on the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came to the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to uh, went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you wings of eagles, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, and for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. In other words, God is reminding the Israelites, I've saved you by my mighty hand, I've redeemed you, and now you are a people that is set apart. You belong to me. God had created a people just for himself and set them apart. This entire section of Exodus is Moses' encounter with God in Mount Sinai as it continues on through the book of Exodus in these next several chapters. Um, this commandment uh, is that when, G when Moses received would set the Israelites apart from the peoples of the world as a unique people for his own possession. We're God's possession. We're children of God, the creator, of Jehovah himself. Moses had been on Mount Sinai all through these chapters in Exodus, hearing from God for the first 12 chapters. And then the final issue, the final commandment comes down, uh, it concerns the Sabbath. In recent weeks, we've heard from Sabbath, actually recent months, Pastor Greg started in January and talked about restolutions and the Sabbath and the importance of resting. We've had this experience uh, through the, this, this corona uh, time of, of, of almost having a, a forced Sabbath of rest and hopefully some time with the Lord. But for the first time in the Word of God, the Sabbath is commanded and explained. The Sabbath day was given to man right after creation and it was observed universally. However, when it came to the Mosaic system, we find that God made it one of the Ten Commandments for His children, the children of Israel. At this time, God makes it quite clear that the Sabbath is only for the children of Israel. This special day was a sign between God and Israel throughout all the generations. And we find that in Exodus 31, 13, where it says, The purpose of the Sabbath was that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. I am Jehovah Mekadesh. In Exodus 31, 13, God is saying to them, you're my people and treasured possession, and this is the way I want you to live. Work for six days and rest on the seventh. And why? Because I want to remind you week in and week out that I am the one that sanctifies you. It's not self-sanctification. It is God who sanctifies us. So why should this bring, this bring us joy and relief and maybe a sweetness to our soul? It's because the Lord who redeemed us, and it's the Lord who sanctifies us. It's not you, it's not me, uh, it's not a set of rules or a, low, uh, a law uh, to live by or a code to live by, it's the Lord. And when I think about that, there is great relief that comes that. The pressure is off. The pressure is on the Lord. The word sanctify means holy and set apart, consecrated and sep uh, separated unto God. First Peter 1.16, we're told, you shall be holy, for I am holy. 
Just this week in Fight the Good Fight, our men's study, uh, we have continued on during this time of studying together. We've gone through Galatians and we started this past week of Titus. And it talks about roles of leadership and overseers and the way we're supposed to live. And all those things really are brought about through the process of sanctification. The list of the things that, that Paul writes in Titus, they're things that are un, un, uh, they're, they're unattainable for us. They're only attainable through Christ and through his sanctification process. So you might say, I'm, I've tried, I've tried to be holy. I've worked so hard to be holy and it just isn't working. I'm frustrated, I'm disappointed, and I'm tired. I can't do it. And this is what the Lord says, listen to me. I'm Jehovah Mekedesh. I'm the Lord who sanctifies you. I'm the Lord who makes you holy. Enter into my name and enter into my rest. Just as salvation comes through resting in Christ, sanctification comes through Christ as well. Erwin Manis in his book, uh, An An Unstoppable Force, um, he says this, the art of a story, stories define and direct. The Bible is full of stories and the church was born out of stories. We are but a chapter of the whole historical account of God's love and Jesus' purpose. People without stories will search for those with stories. Biblical stories of God's movement shows what life can be like for all. Great stories create a great future. So to see how God can work in our lives concerning his name, Jehovah Mekedesh, a familiar story or metaphor in the book of Hebrews comes to mind and where I want to spend just the next few minutes. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and we're going to read it, and then we're going to talk about five things to keep in mind when applying this name of Jehovah Mekedesh, the God who sanctifies. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy this was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against him so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. Five things to keep in mind when applying Jehovah Mekedesh, the Lord who sanctifies our lives. Number one, recognize that your spiritual life is a journey. Our spiritual life is a journey. It's not a sprint. It's not an event. It is a journey. It's a race. It's a marathon. Paul tells us that it is a race marked out for us. And he understood this uh, in Philippians 1, 6, where he says, And I'm sure that God who began a good work within you will be faithful to complete his work until it's finally finished. And on that day when Jesus Christ comes again. The word began means salvation. The word continue in that scripture means sanctification, the process of the journey. So God began it through salvation. He's going to continue it and complete it through sanctification, through the journey. When uh, when I think about this, this idea of a journey and sanctification, the best illustration that comes to mind is a trip. I grew up in Dallas, outside of Dallas on the east side in Garland. And we would go back to Garland. Uh, We still do. My father lives there. But we would go back as a family, especially when the kids were younger. And we would talk about the trip to Garland. It was was quite a journey, especially when we'd go back to maybe Thanksgiving. It all started with everyone excited, all three boys and Paige. We'd pack the car. We'd be doing stuff. We'd be getting ready. And then we'd hit the road, and we'd get to about I-4. 45 and I 10 and my boys would start saying are we there yet dad are we there yet how much longer another five miles they're complaining Harrison's leaning on me Chambers is on my side Preston's bugging me uh, and I just thought this is this is not going to work but are we there yet and I would keep thinking I wish we were there that's the question and is a sign of immaturity the reason people have walked away from God and walked away from the church is really possibly because of spiritual immaturity. They say, are we there yet? Come on, God. I'm doing all these things and I'm not changing the way I should. Are you, are you done yet? I've had this problem and I've been working on it for a week now. You must not work. You must not be for me. Where are you? And they walk off. We're such an instant gratification society. I'm, I'm the guiltiest. I'm the worst. I'll walk into an elevator and I'll push the same button for floor number three 15 times to get us there. Or I'll stand in front of the microwave as it's ticking down. I'm saying, hurry up. I I, I need my food in front of a microwave. There's no faster way to cook it. The problem is that we don't understand God's economy of time. The good news of the journey is this. No, we're not there yet. We are a work in progress. And this roadmap to sanctification we're talking about starts with the understanding that it really is a journey. 
It's a journey. It's not a sprint. It's not an event. It's not even the destination. Number two, though, has to do with that. We need to set our sights on the final destination. We need to set our sights on the final destination. If you want to cooperate with God's plan for sanctification, you have to set your mind. I have to set my mind and my sights on the final destination. It's basic travel etiquette, if you will. Again, we'll go back to Thanksgiving. From the time we get in the car, we've talked about what we're going to do in Dallas, who we're going to see, where each of us are going to sleep, what we're going to eat. That's always a topic. And then we focused on the destination of being Big D when we got to Dallas. If you're a Christian, the final destination is Jesus Christ. Later on, in, or just before Hebrews 12 and Hebrews 10, 10, it says, and what God wants for us is to be made holy, to be set apart, not set above, but to be set apart. It's set apart from the world's way. Our final destination is Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let's go back to this marathon illustration, if you will. I know several people who train for marathons. I don't know why you would ever want to do that, but there's people that do it. I talked to a friend last week, and, and he was on a crutch. And I said, Pete, why are you on a crutch? And he said, well, I've been, I was training for a marathon. He's done 30 marathons. I can't imagine doing 30 marathons. I can't imagine doing one. But apparently when you train, you you train in segments. You practice, you do six miles, and you build a 12 miles, and you do 16 miles, 18 miles, and then you get up to the 26-mile mark. And that's the destination. That's the goal. So how can he do this, and why would he want to do this? I I don't know. But it's because people that train for marathons, their eyes are set on the final destination. They're set on the final destination. So in our lives, people freak out about it. They say, "What, what if I mess up? In our journey, in our life, you are going to mess up. I mess up every day, every second. But God is an inside God. He wants to sanctify us from the inside out. That's the good news. We're typically outer world people. We're concerned with how we look, where we live, what we look like. God's internal. He's a good investor. He's more concerned about the internal, the, the, the external, internal. He's about changing our hearts and our souls. Paul in 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says, And as the Spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more and more like Him and reflect His glory even more. The more the Spirit of God is at work within us, the more we become like Him and we reflect Jesus. Doug Fields of Saddleback Church, he says this, Don't confuse religion and biblical knowledge with the transformation of your heart. If you want a picture of a changed life, you look for the person who has humbly rearranged their life and their marriage and their parenting around what God says. If you want a picture of a changed life, you show me someone who, when no one is watching their life, chooses God's way instead of the way of sinful pleasures when no one's watching. If you want a picture of a changed life, show me someone who manages their money and their resources in the way God teaches. Somebody who hungers and thirsts after knowing God, so he will be uh, be translated into a genuine love for other people. That's a picture, and it takes a while to complete. Are we there yet? We're not there. You got to set our sights, set our sights on the final destination. The third thing is we have to ask God to help us with our roadblocks. Roadblocks, they're just a part of life. There are areas of our life that slow down our movement. They slow down the momentum. They slow down where we're going. They slam on the brakes of, of change. Some are obvious and some are hidden. Again, back in Hebrews verse 1 of chapter 12, he says, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run. The sin, the, the, the thing to throw off is the sin. Competing runners, think about this, the uniform they wear is, is, is sleek. It's made of a certain, uh, certain type of material. They're typically shaven and smooth. There's, there's no resistance, if you will, so they can run faster. Um, we usually confess to God that we have a roadblock, uh, a problem in our walk, and that's called sin, but then we try to fix it on our own. Let me ask you a question real quickly, just rhetorically. What is one of your roadblocks that's stunning your spiritual growth? What is one of your roadblocks that's stunning your spiritual growth? I just think, swear, just one? That's all I get? I'm just asking for one. What is it that God brings to mind? 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Paul goes on, he says, Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence or awe for God. Let us throw off everything, is what Scripture says. These are the roadblocks. You know what they are, and you know when they appear. 
Uh, going back to Dallas, the, the illustration, every time I go to Dallas, it doesn't matter. I've lived in Houston for over 30 years. There's always construction somewhere on 45 between Corsicana uh, around that area. Uh, uh, Conroe, Woodlands, there's, there's always increasing the, the size of the freeway. And I know it's going to be there. There's a roadblock. And so um, one of the recent times I went, I had to exit and we had to go off the, the beaten path and through a little town and back up, back to the road. And that's exactly what we had a detour and we had an unexpected roadblock in a different place. God didn't remove the roadblock or the construction for our trip. He just took us down a different road and a different route to get to our destination. He does that in our lives. We're in that right now. We're in that right now with this time of isolation. God put up a roadblock, if you will. And the roadblock is not to, to uh, make things so frustrating till we can't get to final destination. It's part of it. It's part of the final destination that God wants to grow in us and change us and show us something new that we wouldn't have known if we would have gone, can't continue down the same road on this journey that we were on. Jehovah Mekedesh, Mekedesh sometimes leads us down a new path or a road to complete his purpose. You say, God, I can't do it on my own. I can't remove this on my own strength. You are my only hope. And so we have to ask God for help with our roadblocks. The fourth thing is to learn how to refuel. Learn how to refuel. Recently, we were on so close to E and we decided to go uh, in, uh, into Houston from Cyprus. And uh, we sh- I should have known. We should have filled up, but we didn't. And I found myself, as we were going on the trip, my, my hands kept getting tighter. My grip on the steering wheel, I kept looking at the gas gauge. I kept looking at the, the signal that said, you have this many more miles. And I just kept thinking, I'm way too old and, uh, and I've been driving way too long to run out of gas. Uh, it brought on stress. It brought on um, angst. It brought all those things things that you feel when you uh, when you feel like you're really going to run out when you run out of fuel that's not living but that's really the majority of our world and how Christians live we need to be refueled every day I need to be topped off if you will by the creator Jehovah Makedesh things work best when we're connected to God Hebrews 12 3 says consider him who endured such opposition from sinful man so that you will not grow weary and lose heart The refueling has to come from God, not from our circumstances or even in this situation from leisure activities. It's not going to come from going back to work. It's not going to come from back from uh, getting back into the life that we once knew or a framework or a routine. The refreshing has to come from God. Remember the Sabbath. It's a day to be refueled. Consider him. Jehovah Mekedesh. And the last thing, pause along the way to celebrate their progress pause along the way to celebrate their progress. Again, going to to Dallas on our trip, we have mile markers. We know we we go to Woodlands, then we hit Huntsville, then we hit Madisonville, then we hit Centerfield. We usually slow down in those areas uh, because there's there's law enforcement there. We go to Fairfield. uh, We go to Corsicana. We go through Ferris. We go to Wilmer Hutchins. And then we finally hit Dallas. With each one of those, I celebrate my progress. I know how much further I have to go. Um, It's like each one of those exits is cheering me on says that in Hebrews, actually, chapter 12, verse 1. We're surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses. This refers to chapter 11 in Hebrews, actually, which is known as the Faith Hall of Fame. It's a listing of all these people throughout the Bible who have been faithful servants, um, who have gone before us, who are in heaven with God now, who cheer us on and encourage us. Uh, we've we started running and walking during this uh, COVID time out in Cyprus and Bridgeland where we live. And uh, along the way, we found that people have put these rocks and they're, we, we've named them scripture stones. And this, it's similar to this one. This is painted white and it has the word holiness on it. Some of them just have scripture. Some of them, I found one last night that had the Batman logo on it, all different things I think the kids have made. And they're just along all the trails in different places. And they're, they're, they're things of encouragement. There are things that say, you know, keep, keep going. Some are scripture, some are drawing, some are just sayings, whatever it is. But those are just witnesses in front of us saying, hey, come on, let's continue on this journey. Keep running, if you will. Uh, keep living, keep doing what God has called us to do in this time. When you run the race with each step, there are people there celebrating and encouraging us. Pause along the way to celebrate the progress. Five things we can learn from Hebrews today. Recognize that your spiritual life's a journey. Set your sights on your final destination. Ask God to help us with the roadblocks. Learn how to refuel. And then pause along the way to to celebrate our progress. 
I think again right now we're in the situation where we can put those things to, to real, real life every day. And I wanna encourage you to do that. Lord, thank you so much for loving us, Lord, for being our healer, for being our provider, Lord, for being our banner that we can live under. And then today, Lord, the reminder that you are the one who sanctifies us. It's not up to me. It's not up to the way I live, a code of honor or a, or a list of to-dos and to-don'ts, Lord. You created us to be set apart, to be your children, to be your sons and daughters, Lord. Jesus, thank you that you empower us to live that way through your Holy Spirit. And I pray that we'd experience that today. We love you and we look forward to the ultimate destination of not just you living in us, but, uh, but, but us living in your presence in heaven. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining me today. Hey, if you have a prayer need or you have a need or you want to help me to need, cypress at houstonsfirst.org is the, is the email. If you'll reach out to us, we'll reach back and pray for you. Have a great day. Talk to you soon.